Uh, very much welcome to Kaustinen ICH 2022 uh, seminar. We are talking uh, today about uh, non-formal uh, music education and then we are talking about intangible cultural heritage. And uh, we have some great groups from around the world, from Mauritius and uh, Denmark and then also from Finland, Napsberg. And we will hear some practical uh, knowledge and, and uh, sounds and, and music about the topic, but also we will, we will have a, we have a great uh, uh, presenters here uh, today, and we will kind of also think about more uh, academic side or more about the, the, the theoretical side about the topic. And uh, my name is Matti Hakamäki. I'm director of Finnish Folk Music Institute. <coughs> And uh, this is actually a dream come true for me that we really have uh, three hours here to talk about these matters. I think these are very, very important. Like we have had uh, nice discussions with Tuve and with uh, Abe also that uh, about the, the how the world should be changed so that it understands our messages. And uh, I'm sure that we will get a lot of knowledge from these uh, few hours. Um, uh, just a little definition in the beginning. Uh, UNESCO uses the term non-formal uh, education. And uh, at least from my side, maybe uh, uh, there will be other views also. But how I have understood it that, uh, that you can talk about uh, um, um, uh, non-formal education and then formal education and informal mm -hmm. education. And uh, when we talk about non-formal, we are talking about something that is a little bit different than the norm normal schooling system that we have. And then we are not talking about informal, which is more about the, the, uh, how the tradition has its own in, the, in families, for example. But uh, it's something in between. And I think... Uh, uh, today we will uh, be somewhere there mm -hmm. and uh, and hear many uh, nice practical examples about this. So, yeah, welcome to all. And then uh, first we have uh, Birgit Ellinghaus, director from Albach Kultur. Or cult how do I say Kultur? very much uh, uh, Mati and the uh, Kaustin Festival Folk Music Institute for inviting me and uh, I'm happy uh, to see you all here. Um, uh, myself, I'm uh, not, uh, which, which one is this? Yeah. Yeah. Um, myself, I'm not an academic, uh, although I'm working since uh, many years in, in the field uh, because I'm uh, working in connection with the German UNESCO Commission and uh, I'm appointed member of the National Commission uh, 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 of the National uh, Council uh, of Culture of the German UNESCO Commission and um, so um, uh, I'm in the field and being practitioner practical, uh, involved in uh, all kinds of musics of the world since many years. So this is just a, a little bit to situate uh, where we are go where I would like to invite you uh, to go uh, today with me uh, to have a look uh, into uh, the perspective of folk music education. Uh, to the safeguarding of intangible cultural heritage in a time we have to face nowadays, a time of war, of globalization, and le at the end of uh, post-colonialism. So uh, it's to, to, to update our view on the world. So uh, if we look the world today, unfortunately, uh, we have to see that there are many armed conflicts and wars, and this is a map from 2021, and each of the points you see 
is an armed war and it's definitely not the final uh, list because these are only the big, uh, the big wars or the big uh, uh, armed conflicts and uh, uh, many of those uh, territories are in countries with a very old and very sophisticated music tradition. So the question is, what happened to this situation when we look into the music, um, when uh, the armed conflicts and the wars um, interfere in uh, the music traditions? Um, the first impact we have to face is um, that we see enforced mobility of, of musicians. What is enforced mobility? Um, we know from festivals like Kaustinen, mobility is, mobility of artists is in a way fundamental uh, to visit other colleagues of music in another village or in another uh, com neighboring country and uh, to, to make tours. Uh, this is what we call the voluntary mobility, uh, inspiring encounters. But then we have that what is enforced mobility, which is not voluntary. It's exactly the opposite. And um, this is uh, touching as the musicians, but as well all the, the other professionals around, the music teachers, uh, uh, those who are working on instrument making, all those uh, uh, people might have to move the location to avoid sensors a censorship and uh, a persecution, um, or as well we have now a lot of uh, uh, natural disasters uh, caused by armed uh, conflicts. Um, we have uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, violation of uh, human rights to women, uh, to uh, uh, LGBT uh, uh, people, so all this um, uh, is now part of the reality if we look into, uh, uh, into music uh, because um, we have a lot of musicians being touched to these um, uh, uh, problems and they have to leave their original um, land or village or country and um, go to another country, but they assume in general that they would stay just a little moment and uh, return back as soon as possible because they are very much attached, especially musicians are very much attached to where they are coming from. Uh, and when they are abroad in another country, their civic status is really uh, in, 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 in a very um, uh, yeah, various uh, dimension not clear. It could be uh, that somebody uh, is um, looking uh, to, to get recognized as refugee, uh, but uh, there are a lot of people being clandestine uh, in uh, territories. Uh, which has an impact on uh, um, musical work as well, or um, uh, some uh, uh, have just denied to stay in that country and they have to move again to another country. Um, so this is uh, a part of the reality, and uh, some uh, musicians just uh, are classified as migrants because they don't get asylum, but they are migrants and maybe because of their professional background they are recognized as migrants and give, uh, 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 are given um, the permission to stay. Do we speak about a minority? No. These are the latest statistics from 2022 uh, about um, uh, displaced uh, uh, people in the world and we reach in 
2022, 100 million people worldwide. So 100 million people, and from this, uh, we know how, how important is music. Um, we have a big, big number of musicians uh, being displaced. So we, we do not speak a minority problem, we speak really about what um, uh, becomes more and more um, heavy in the world. If we break it down uh, to, uh, to one country, this is just a statistic from 2017 from Germany, and uh, in 2017 we had more or less uh, a quarter of the population uh, with migrant background included uh, uh, those uh, um, uh, of enforced mobility, displaced people. Uh, and I just checked this morning the latest statistics from 2021. We have now reached already three and a half million more in the time between 2017 and 2021. And uh, uh, we are now about, uh, in Germany, we have now uh, upon 30% uh, um, of uh, uh, people with migrant background. So we can't uh, say anymore uh, that we have uh, uh, a uniformed cultural um, landscape in the country. Um, which is the UNESCO Convention looking into this today's uh, situation? Uh, this is primarily the convention uh, for the pro uh, protection and the promotion of cultural diversity. Because this convention is specifically uh, um, uh, um, conceived uh, about contemporary art and culture. And when we have a contemporary uh, phenomenon, as we saw with, uh, um, uh, with uh, uh, displaced uh, people, then we have to uh, think that uh, this convention uh, might give us some guidance uh, uh, in looking to this new cultural landscape uh, we have uh, more or less everywhere in the world. Uh, but this uh, convention goes along with the UNESCO Convention um, uh, for um, uh, Intangible Cultural Heritage and we can really recognize that these both conventions are complementary. Um, the Convention for um, uh, uh, Intangible Cultural Heritage goes back to the 1970s. So it was a time much before this, um, uh, this massive um, displacement of people and more uh, to uh, locally based uh, music traditions and um, this had been, uh, the convention had been conceived um, after the model of uh, uh, World Heritage Convention which goes even more back and the World Heritage Convention is about uh, landscapes and buildings so what is uh, in a place and you can't move it somewhere else. And so the, the original Intangible Cultural Heritage Convention took a lot of elements from this convention of uh, world heritage and uh, had a kind of stable view of culture. This was the beginning and uh, the, the uh, preliminary pro, uh, work programs of UNESCO was a masterpieces program uh, which were identified in some cultures and uh, the uh, living human treasure programs uh, and they still had the concept of a kind of stable uh, uh, look uh, uh, towards uh, uh, intang intangible cultural heritage. But this had been adapted and today um, uh, the intangible cultural heritage uh, is uh, uh, reviewed in a more dynamic way um, uh, and this is uh, expressed through the um, 
let's say, the, the general uh, 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 word, knowing, doing, passing it on, and then we are uh, for sure in all what is uh, music education. And it's uh, specially uh, uh, extended to be inclusive, represented, and community-based. Uh, so we have a kind of uh, changing approach in the culture, uh, intangible cultural heritage uh, uh, um, uh, um, concept as well. So um, what do we, if we know that we have now this, um, uh, this massive uh, movement of people uh, in, in the world, what does it mean for the, uh, for the music? We have to reflect diversity, uh, the, uh, uh, the diversity of cultural manifestations, expressions and practices included the di displaced people and migrants. Uh, so we have not to separate them and say they, they have their stuff and we have ours and we look... Uh, okay. Uh, so um, uh, we have to see the super diverse population. We have new definitions of uh, 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 music communities which might be more multicultural. Uh, we have to uh, uh, adapt to uh, new circumstances and times and uh, to, to kick away the national principle of uh, intangible cultural heritage in favor of uh, 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 local, global, and uh, uh, local, regional, and global um, approach. The role of uh, the music in, in, in those times um, has changed as well, uh, and we put in the middle uh, human, uh, the, uh, the human societies and what is the role of music in human societies. Um, I have only three minutes more, so I rush a little bit across, um, but we have to re review all these different uh, aspects of uh, what happened to rural music when it comes to urban context. Uh, what happened uh, with music um, uh, uh, of displaced people when they come uh, and live in unusual uh, contexts like uh, um, uh, refugee camps. Uh, how can we work with uh, cultural rights? We defend very much uh, when those people have no vote. Um, and um, to make it a little bit practical, I would just uh, give you three examples of, of groups, uh, which gives a little bit the, 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 the complication on a different level. Um, last year, when the Taliban entered uh, Afghanistan uh, and they banned uh, <coughs> Afghan music, uh, the um, Afghan uh, National Institute of uh, Music uh, from Kabul, um, uh, which had about 300 uh, students, staff, and uh, uh, old masters, um, uh, they had been evacuated, and they are now evacuated with a whole group, with uh, nearly 300 people in Portugal, uh, so we have a kind of homogene uh, um, group. What happened to them for the future to become not a ghetto? And to, because we saw what happened during the Nazi time to uh, certain migrant communities who had to flee Europe uh, and who became a ghetto and lost the contemporary uh, connection to their own music. This is one example. The second example is uh, more recent uh, with uh, uh, Dakabata, one of the very world famous uh, music vocal groups from Ukraine. Uh, this group had not been evacuated as entire group, but each member individually. Now they are uh, split in, in, in three countries. Uh, one, one part is in Seattle, one is in France, 
and uh, there are some people left in Ukraine. How is it possible to maintain uh, uh, music if, uh, and how to transfer knowledge if uh, the members are uh, dis uh, displaced in different territories? And the third example is a project I uh, realized last year. I made a mapping in our region about uh, uh, refugee musician, master musician only based in our region and uh, identified uh, eight uh, musicians from eight different countries and brought them together because they are all connected through the, a kind of makam improvisation um, and we identified uh, together with them what is their connecting point and uh, they were commissioned uh, to create new music and we created a huge orchestra. Um, so this, uh, and we, uh, we, uh, uh, um, uh, we made interviews with them, what was their way to Germany? And it is incredible uh, to know what brought them to Germany uh, individually. So I, I know I have only two minutes more, uh, or one minute. Um, so I um, have some uh, good examples, or let's say, impulse for music uh, education, um, uh, good examples for archiving, mapping, uh, for professional uh, formation in transcultural music of the today's world, and uh, as well for those who are the administrator and those who are um, uh, working to conceive the, the music landscape, how to, uh, to, to be on equal level to develop new perspectives. Um, I will, uh, for those who would like to have the presentation with the links, um, you can get it uh, if you uh, ask to uh, Uti, and she will send you the PDF, and you can explore the links. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Birgit, uh, for a very nice uh, kind of overview of the global uh, situation and need of change, as I maybe interpreted it, that, uh, that uh, not only national level, but the regional, local level, and the global level, they are kind of the future of uh, also the folk music uh, education, kind of the reality because of the, the super diversity and the displaced uh, uh, the cultures, the world is changing, so we, we kind of uh, have to also react to that uh, in the folk music Seeing with the folk music uh, education and uh, informal education. Then next, uh, please, Vilma yes. Timonen. Welcome. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Good morning. Great to be here, and thank you. Uh, for Kansa Music Institute for organizing all these wonderful activities and this seminar in particular. It's going to be wonderful to share some discussions with all of you uh, today. Um, I'm Vilma Timonen, uh, a musician, educator and scholar. Uh, I play kantele and my musicianship is and work as a folk music educator uh, are rooted in the rich cultural heritage of the Finno-Baltic and Nordic regions. The questions related to processes where forms of memory-based music making are relocated into the contemporary educational and artistic environments have outlined my professionality throughout. As a scholar, my work is underlined with critical activist notions as I draw trajectories between individual, societal and global and aim to address matters relevant to our time. In this presentation, I'll discuss some theoretical and practical perspectives involved in scrutiny on how formal education could better respond to efforts of revitalizing and sustaining of diverse cultural expressions, such as musical heritage of communities 
the current and historical ones through formal education in ways that it could contribute to cultural sustainability locally and globally. When envisioning the ways for form, how formal music education could contribute to cultural sustainability, policy level starting points can be found, for instance, in the United Nations Agenda for Sustainable Development. This agenda highlights the viability of culture which contributes to the well-being of people, increases resilience, enhances appreciation of cultural diversity, contributes to decent work and economic growth, and helps build peaceful and inclusive societies. Goal 11.4 connects seamlessly with the UNESCO Convention that highlighted the urgency of ensuring the viability of the intangible cultural heritage, such as traditional musics, through formal educational systems already 2003. However, the task of responding to this call is everything but a simple one. The formal education globally is thoroughly shaped by Western hegemony, which is shaped by a particular kind of knowledge, which is academically produced knowledge that actually only very few people on a global scale has access, let alone the opportunity for pro producing it. Globalizing theorist Arjun Akhandurai argues for expanding the concept of research from its traditional comprehension as something conducted by academically educated professionals to viewing research uh, from a, right, from a right, rights based perspective and regarding it as a universal, elementary, and improvable capacity, and as means that can support individuals executing a full citizenship that requires the capacity to make strategic inquiries and gain strategic knowledge. In indeed, like Apadurai points out, only 20% of the global population is currently included in the knowledge gain. Therefore, to start with, it is important to first take a closer look on how we perceive the concept of knowledge itself and how we understand research. UNESCO documents stress the importance of recognizing local and indigenous knowledge as relevant forms of knowledge alongside academically built knowledge. As musicians, we understand that music is a form of knowledge itself. However, different musical traditions have their own logic, structures, rules and restrictions, a cultural and musical grammar. Also, understanding of what is relevant knowledge is always situated and contextually bound. The burning question is, what could be the role of these kind of kinds of knowledges in formal education. How these knowledges connect with scientific knowledge and what kinds of educational possibilities would open if the formal educational systems could better accommodate and embrace understandings, skills and philosophies developed by societies with long histories. Moreover, would this support more equal opportunities for more people to be included in education and the knowledge game in meaningful and socially and culturally just manner? These questions lead us to consider more widely what do we mean by education? If we think of education as something of which has a goal for supporting the learners, developing positive self-esteem, enabling them to connect with histories and communities, the near and the more distant ones, supporting them to existing in and with the world, as educational theorist Kurt Biesta has put it, 
we must turn the gaze on our educational environments and engage in critical scrutiny of for whom and for what is the education for. What kind of educational aims are guiding us intentionally or unintentionally? And who or what are we excluding with our own choices? The failure of addressing these questions and failing to critically reflect on the ends to which our educational endeavours may lead leaves open the very possibility that our in educational engagements miseducate rather than educate. Indeed, education actually holds a great danger of not being educational at all. Concerning music, and when thinking how communities around the world could benefit from formal music education, we should primarily be interested in the question, what does it mean to be musically educated, opposed to being musically trained? Several music education theorists and philosophers have provided us with useful and inspirational perspectives to what educational music teaching could look like. Bowman, 2002, has discussed philosophical perspectives on educative music education as education through music, not education in or about music. There, the educational approach embeds the contextual, cultural, historical and critical understandings, provides means for creative exploration which is deeply rooted in culturally related ethical responsibilities. The educational potentials of musical experience, participation or music instruction are shaped by our choices. The choices of what music is taught, in what context and most importantly our teaching methodologies. To make these choices in culturally and educationally just manner, I believe, invites us all to cultivate our abilities to listen. They challenge us to listen to diverse and unfamiliar sounds, musics and musical logics. They urge us to cultivate our ability to listen to our pedagogies and how we listen to our multiple positionalities. Indeed, political listening calls for scrutiny from which positionality are we working from? How is the content for our educational activities framed? And whose voices or perspectives are excluded from this frame? Oh, it's missing the title. The title is from multicultural to rooted cosmopolitanism. The role for diverse musical expressions in formal education has for decades been influenced with understandings from multicultural music education. However, the multicultural ideas where the students are offered samples of diverse musics but fail to address what constitutes our understandings of diversity in the first place Moving beyond notions from multiculturalism, some scholars have brought up discussion of rooted cosmopolitanism, which allows to move beyond binaries of local and global. Instead, it highlights that in-depth immersion to a musical tradition provides means and openness to diversity and difference also elsewhere. These views were deep connection with a tradition holistically contests and counters the multicultural perspective where the students are to gain superficial understanding of several music cultures and emphasize the breadth over depth. Also, the perspectives on rooted approaches to music education highlight that focus should not be on the importance of inclusiv inclusivity and diversity per se, as it should be on critical engagement, empowerment and creativity. Diverse and inclusive curricula and educational practices 
facilitate critical examination of any music and music education methods and thereby also wider participation and communication are then more likely to enhance personal and collective agency and satisfaction while also contributing to more creative, equitable and productive society. The 21st century music education urgently calls for identifying the structural frames and related power issues. When matters of diversity and inclusiveness are at stake in particular. Moreover, questions concerning cultural sustainability could be notably supported by enhancing our decolonial understandings. While colonialism at its most harsh forms poses a threat to people's existence and fulfillment of human rights, several other, other kinds of politics and colonialism have significant impact on cultural sustainability. However, it is important to note here that politics here refers not only to party or state level policies, but also to how we all exercise power and agency in our everyday life. As many scholars point out, in the context of music education, Western classical music and increasingly nowadays the Western popular music have acted as a global colonizer in many ways. As one example of cultural colonialism, in my recent research with uh, my Nepali colleague Rusu Tuladar, uh, we faced a situation where our informants from Finland and Nepal tried to describe the kind of rhythmical <coughs> phrasing and form of metrics inherent to traditional musics in their own regions. What we discovered is that the vocabulary available was uneven metrics or unstable tempo, both referring that there is something quite unlike, something not quite right in this music. Also, our informants explained how they struggled to perform these traditions according to this kind of phrasing in contemporary performance settings. So, instead of nurturing the artistic expressions that would grow from the tradition in its own right, they often chose to perform the music with stable phrasing, assimilating Western aesthetics to these musical traditions. In her discussion of epistemological colonialism, Bradley 2012 highlights how terminology used in music education, such as fluidity and hybridity, may at first feel attractive as they seem to resonate with ways new musical forms emerge from cross-cultural contact. However, scholars argue that such conceptualizations ignore historical, economic and material conditions of difference by directing attention away from the critical questions related to disparities in power and, again, fail to address what constitutes diversity in the first place. What's with the titles there? <coughs> ah, as that title is formal, non-formal. <laughs> Another central tension, uh, indeed, is uh, that calls for our attention is the one between formal and non-formal. As the traditional way of practicing music at the community level is based on informal or non-formal education, which can be understood as being more related to socio-cultural <coughs> reproduction rather than social change, the role of formal music education or formal education can in turn be seen as inherently not about the insertion, insertion of newcomers into existing orders, but about ways of being that hint at independence from such orders. Therefore, the traditional forms of musical transmission are inevitably challenged in the new context of formal music education. This tension also consists the role questions concerning the role of the community when relocating these musics into formal education 
and how the informal and non-formal practices of transmission could perhaps inspire and maybe even more so inform formal education. This matter indeed calls for further innovative and experimental research. So, oh, am I missing one? Drawing from the uh, theoretical perspectives presented here, the vision for formal education that would support cultural sustainability might look something like this. However, in practical terms, this vision that is rooted in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and UNESCO Convention's notions of sustainable development demands actually a lot. Indeed, the road towards this vision is paved with hard work, questioning our own groundings, revisiting our good intentions and epistemologies. It offers difficult questions, laying front complexities with no simple solutions or answers or one-size-fits-all solution. However, coming back to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, we might also find means to put this vision into practice. In my previous research, I've utilized collaborative participatory research approaches that are built on globalizing framework, which does not suggest flying around the globe on a regular basis. Rather, it is a mindset where the fact that in these times of globalization, all of our actions, despite our location, nationality, we are connected and our actions have impact on a global scale. Global partnerships support improving the capacities to recognize the hegemonies, various types of knowledges, encourage our abilities to see behind the Western hegemonies that frame our educational, artistic and academic understandings. Indeed, the power of working together, discovering new questions collaboratively, developing partnerships that are based on collaborative knowledge building through critical engagements might serve as an effective way forward in constructing culturally sustainable and more socially just future for formal education and music education. Thank you. And here is a uh, the research I was uh, briefly mentioning, it's going to be published next week or this week, we can almost say now, so go ahead and check it out. But thank you. Thank you, Vilma, very much. So now we heard uh, from Birgit the complexity of the world and from uh, Vilma the complexity of uh, music education and uh, kind of the situation, how the, the, the folk music education or music education uh, has to react or can react and what well, kind of things we have to take into consideration. So we more, uh, we have uh, heard and learned uh, about the complexities and maybe have more questions than answers and now we turn to the answer part and uh, kind of uh, what kind of uh, practices might be helpful with this work. Um, Vilma, thank you so much for your uh, experience with uh, your, for your long experience with working with uh, Nepal and with this collaborative uh, uh, method and also we have at the Finnish Folk Music Institute we are very happy that we have been also collaborating, I had, had this great chance to, to learn with you. But um, uh, from Mauritius, we have Kub Abe, please. So, hello everybody. Um, it's amazing how people all around the world feel 
interested and concerned, really concerned about the fate of culture, the fate of music, and the way things have been going on, and the impact that phenomena such as wars, power relations, affect people through that medium of music and culture. I would like, in the first instance, to uh, say a big thank you to Marty and the Kaustinen people for having invited our association to this festival and for having provided us, provided us with the opportunity to share our experience uh, during this workshop. This is the first thing. The second thing is uh, our big thanks to the two presenters. They have been really brilliant in telling us about how they view things from their different perspectives and I'm really uh, happy that uh, we are here among people who know what we are talking about because all of you are practitioners and this is the most important thing when we pretend to talk about culture. So the first thing is to be able to be sensitive to a number of things. And when I started to think about the first presentation on the impact of war, for example, on those types of phenomena, I considered that indeed we've been through all those processes for centuries in Mauritius mm. because uh, Mauritius is a post-colonial society but at the very beginning it started with slavery with dehumanization of its people to the extent that there has been linguistic genocide over here. None of the languages that were spoken by the slaves are in existence in Mauritius. But then the good part of it is that the capacity of the human being, of the human nature, has made it possible to create a new language, which is the Creole language, which is now the mother tongue of 97% of the Mauritian. So we got through those hardships. I'm not saying that people living in very stressful conditions of wars should complain. But then we've gone through that as well. Our ancestors have gone through that and many of them have died in disastrous conditions. But there is hope. There is hope because human nature has the capacity to create and recreate anywhere you put it with some enlightenment, with some structures, with some concepts and ideas that enlightened people are able to put forward, we really believe that there is always hope. And this is why we continue to believe that wherever people live, in whatever conditions they live, they are bound to create things for not only their survival, but for the development. So this is the starting point for us because we do believe that culture, development, starts where people live, in families, at home. This would be for us the most precious area 
of knowledge. So how we go about it is to show due respect for the communities, for families, for people who are striving, for people who have invented ways and means to be able to internalize a lot of emotions in order to face dire situations. So in terms of culture, when children come to us, they bring along with them what their mothers, their grandmothers have taught them in terms of how to internalize fear. They play. They have shown how through traditional medicine, for example, they've been able to get through diseases. They are able to show us to what extent traditional knowledge is powerful. So, first of all, there is that respect for communities, for families, for which we have and we must show great respect by taking them on board. Secondly, as an organization, we believe that we form part of that second area of knowledge. Because when they come in, having gone through so many experiences, we are in a position to observe, to participate with them, to take on board all that richness and try to revitalize it. Because society at large, because of its form, because the way it functions with the power relations that had been, have been explained by the previous interveners, they put in danger all those richnesses and it is our duty to try to resist through revitalizing those elements in culture so that in doing so we can just give it back to the people and when you give it back to the people they show a big response to that they show that they own it they own something and with that alliance because it is an alliance between the communities and the organization like ours we can go to the authorities but the authorities they would listen more to academics I'm sorry that's the way they do it so we go to the authorities it's really difficult in Mauritius to talk to academics in the field of culture don't ask me why <laughs> I leave it open to you but anyway there are some of them that have been sensitive to what we've been doing but then our main focus as organization has been to go directly to the state and to tell them hey it is your duty to respect the mother tongue we can't go on like that oppressing that language and some 10 years back the state decided to introduce the Creole language in the education system. So it's a long way, quite a long way for us, having had our native tongue recognized and taught in school, but then we have still a long way to go because we need to get it as a medium of instruction. Just as you people who are here have it, and it has worked wonders according to us. So these are how we've been trying to revitalize elements in our culture. It starts with conversations that kids have at home. It starts with the bribes of stories that they bring in. 
we try just to observe, to see. And the most important thing is how we allow those kids, the new generation, to adapt on things that the previous generations have created or recreated. So this responds pretty well to what the convention on ICH requests us to do. And it is meaningful and it is in this way only that it becomes meaningful to the overall population. So our experience has been very conclusive in that whatever we've been doing with the kids in form of creation and recreation processes when it gets back to the population, even for those known to be resistant, they are not insensitive. So they'll participate. They'll give some sort of praise to it. So that has been our work in a country uh, known to have gone through all those types of ethnic divisions, but we hold the country, we are known to be holding the country, to contribute, to hold the country as a nation through arts and music. So uh, we've, been, we've gone as far as um, producing school materials, for example, uh, in the mother tongue, but with an outlook on foreign languages which makes us in a position to uh, offer some sort of services to the state in uh, training. We don't really like that the word training is more about capacity building of teachers to use those materials or the most important thing is to create their own materials with the kids. It has to do with, with pedagogy. It has to do with the way you envisage teaching. It's not about that didactic method of getting the learner, the program, and the teacher. It is much more than that. It has to do with pedagogy, meaning really openness, taking from the learners, using methods and means that become relevant to us. So, as experience, I ask Marudia to just uh, tell us a little bit about Thank you. what we've been Thank doing. You. I'm Marudia, I'm the coordinator of the NGO, which now exists, uh, which will be celebrating its 40th uh, anniversary this year. And uh, from this organization, then there's the musical group, which is called Group Abbe, which has been in existence then for about, uh, since the start. We have had uh, almost 17 albums, all in Creole language, and also which contain uh, another mother tongue of Mauritius, which is really in danger now, which is the Boj Puri. So to continue on what Alain was saying about the pedagogical material, um, the, the practice is, is uh, very basically, uh, school runs formally in Mauritius from Monday to Friday, and then kids, they also go to tuitions on Saturdays, Sundays, and sometimes public holidays, because the, the, the education is very, uh, um, Yes, there's many competition and also certificate based, you know. And uh, since the start, uh, we, have, we have seen that it's very un unfair, unjust towards the children because then um, they, they also have long hours of, at school, which starts at eight and finishes at, at, uh, at three, and then they have also tuitions. And at the very start, when we started to, to invite kids children to the association, we thought we, we, we just have to give space for, for children to come in, those whose, pa whose parents want them to, to do other things through music, and then they come in and this is how the non-formal education and non-formal music started in Abba. 
they just come in and then we do music with them and on Saturdays it's then the Saturday care activities at Abin. Uh, we have several activities throughout the day. We have uh, music workshops, we have uh, education support but through the Creole language and we started that before the Creole got, in, got into school and we have lunch together and uh, mostly many plays so to give children the, the, the opportunity to express them and, and to be children. And out of the educational support activity, we were able to, uh, to record an album of almost 30 songs and uh, with analysis, like a school curriculum, but a non-formal school curriculum that we use. And then the government was so interested, the, the, the education, Institute of Education of Mauritius and the teachers who teach Creole there, they were interested in what we did. And now this book, which is called Zoli les temps pour enfants, which means uh, nice time for children, are, is are also being used in the formal education system. Now maybe we can do one or two uh, things from, from this album, two, one or two songs. The first one, I'll invite the members of Group Abel to join me. <coughs> Emilio. <laughs> Emmanuel. <laughs> and Shaniza. one will be uh, a song uh, that we use to teach the vowels um, in the Creole language, but then um, this is a song that, that is also very creative around the vowels in the Creole language, but towards the English, the English language, which is the official language in Mauritius. There you go. Are we okay? So the song is called simply A E I O U and in Creole it's A E I O U. <laughs> you can join us if you if you feel like that. Are we ready now?
also use classical songs and uh, so that we don't uh, we open the Creole language to other languages to to all the the cultures of everywhere and we also use then classical songs to uh, translated in Creole language so that the children of Mauritius can play and uh, use the rhythm of other cultures. And uh, I won't tell you which song this one is, and I'm sure you will, you will uh, recognize it very, very easily. But uh, we have to tell you that um, we have the rehearsals twice a week with all the children flocking in from, from the Barclay community. I've, wrote, I've written it here, Barclay community in Mauritius. And um, the rehearsal starts at five in the evening, just after school and last until it's very dark in Mauritius, like in eight, and then a van picks up all the, the, the children and to drop them because it's dark and in the community sometimes it can be very uh, insecure because of, of drug problems and uh, other difficulties in the area. And uh, because the parents, uh, are very happy about what their kids are doing and what, what they are learning and how music also is, uh, is um, uh, helping them in the formal education. They give, the parents give the permission and the children then can, can come even if there are difficult situations. Okay. And then we, can all, we also do uh, songs from the from the um, from what the children um, gets from the news, and we talk much about what's happening um, on the earth, the war, um, the climate change affects us also, as we are a small island, and uh, we know that 
if there are dramatic changes, we can lose our beach and some of our soil. So this is a song on, uh, on what concerns us, what concerns the children, and the song is made through uh, workshops. The, the lyrics are written together with them. They, they say what they feel, and then we, we do the song together and then we, we, we play the music together in the music rehearsals and that's how we make the songs that are very important to us and to the community of Mauritius because we go and do concerts everywhere. So this song is about Mother Earth and Shaniza and Emmanuel is going to tell you about that. I'm hurting, I'm hurting because there's so much pollution. And maybe I'm not Do we have some time to make one more? Maybe we can, we can uh, just very briefly also uh, talk about... We got this from here. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to, 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 to tell briefly the, the assistants who might be interested that we made... Uh, we had for 30 years been the, the founder of the, a school for the Raban, for this drum. And we started it as a... a as a mean of pre prevention in the community because we wanted the kids to, to have some special leisure. And uh, Alain and friends had the brilliant idea to, to make a school for the Raban. And uh, after 30 years, we were able then to, to have a book with a notation system in, uh, in English, a bilingual book in, in, in Creole and in English. And the book is being used then now in, in Mauritius, and there are, there are now many other schools of the Ravan, so it's really uh, very important that the transmission uh, continues. 
and uh, we have also been accredited for the work that we've been doing, the advocacy for the SEGA TIFIC. Uh, we've been then accredited, accredited with UNESCO in 2020. And uh, we are so, it's, it's such a great pleasure to be with you, to be connected with you, and to hear your histories, to experiment your music, to hear all the languages, and to see that we are, we are connected, and even if we are very far in the Indian Ocean. So this, the little story about that is that when um, people went to war because they took people from Mauritius to go to war, Second World War, over there they didn't have the Raban. They had this. Yeah. No? They had this. Mm -hmm. And they transferred that rhythm over over it, over there. And then when they came back to Mauritius, they continued to use this. So they were migrant over there, but they brought their, their, their rhythm and See their how, and their culture. See how resilient <laughs> and resistant mm. humans have been. How we are proud about all those people. So this song is about the sugarcane fields in Mauritius. <coughs>
we are doing there in Mauritius, and that, and then that you knew a little bit more about about this country, this great country, the Republic of Mauritius. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. <laughs>
uh, released after two years, but then he's uh, uh, the one who was supposed to be there instead of him. He didn't show up, so he had to take like two years more. So sometimes it, they could be away for four years. So you can imagine that these people, when they came home, they really wanted to be joyful. They wanted to dance with their loved ones. They wanted to sing. They wanted to uh, be merry uh, and feel part of uh, where you come from. That thing about feeling at home somewhere, even though you were traveling. I'm, I can imagine if you are a refugee, it must be sort of, you, you must have some place or some, maybe you make it inside yourself a place that is home. I don't know. Um, but at least how we experience it in, in Sonoho is that it, uh, that's home, that's where we come from, that's where we grew up. Uh, oh, I didn't actually, I'm from the mainland. <laughs> but um, everything is familiar, uh, the houses stay the same place, um, people grow up. But you still know them, oh, they're from this family, and this is the cousin of this one, and this one, and this one. And um, what is very interesting in, in Sonoho uh, is that small kids will be dancing with grandparents, and there will be um, kids at the parties, even though there is uh, uh, drinking going on, and uh, it's just everybody is normal uh, being people. Uh, and being uh, neighbors and friends and family and uh, the kids grow up um, really like seeing this from an early age that uh, when people get together they, are, they enjoy themselves and they dance and they sing a lot and um, I think that um, it doesn't take really long for the kids to figure out that this is just okay this is just something that we do and uh, when I start teaching the kids, it's, um, it's more or less just about how to play the first note so you can uh, be a part of that. Um, and they, sometimes I just even, uh, they don't have more than one lesson, for instance, then I bring them to the store and you can play at the store and I just play something. And they ask, what? Something. <laughs> and then they are part of it. And in the beginning, for, for the young ones, it'll might, it might take them uh, years before there's even a tune in what they play, but they are part of it. And they start out not being afraid of uh, being around music and being around uh, uh, people enjoying themselves. Uh, and they can, even when they get older, they can use it for people who are not enjoying themselves. They, they actually learn that I make uh, uh, a meaning with my playing even though I don't play very well but people can see that I want to give something uh, and when they grow up which these two guys can tell you much more about is that they realize that this is a really good uh, way of going through life you have this uh, way of observing what's going on and you you can soon spot that oh there needs a little bit of joy here <laughs> um, and then of course uh, the older they uh, they get uh, the more focused we get on um, listening to music around uh, and um, uh, the details the playing and all that and we talk a lot about it and what I notice very much is from the first time the kids have been abroad or in, in another country um, exploring other music traditions, that's the first time when they come home they appreciate their own. That is so interesting. It's sort of like it opens their eyes to what a treasure they grew up with uh, themselves. And uh, it, it really needs to be um, looked at from the other side before you even realize uh, how important it is. I think these guys will tell you as well that uh, I didn't know it was a thing. Before you come out, and here we are in Kaustenen, asked to play family music, 
I don't think when you started playing that you would think we can go to Kalkun and then play Fanny music. What's Fanny music? That's what you play all the time. But <laughs> sort of, sort of. But now they realize that okay, they, we have something, and you feel it uh, uh, much more when you have met other people uh, and their traditions, and you start to uh, to see that oh, that's different. But what comes out in the end is the same. It's the joy around music, and uh, the you want to do it better and better. You want to be better at playing. You want to be better at uh, giving people some things. And you get better at receiving what people uh, give back to you also, just by being around it and doing it all the time. So I don't know, um, I don't know how much I can tell you um, about how I do. Um, as you can hear, it's a very small uh, community. Um, I have normal weekly lessons where uh, they have solo uh, for uh, uh, 25 minutes or whatever it is, and then I have um, ensembles with them where they can join from already from the start. And that is, yes, yeah, somebody will play the tunes and somebody will just play an <coughs> open string or something. Um, and then they gradually get better and better and as soon as they are able to, it, I, I will take them out for uh, lots of gigs where they want uh, the little group of, of kids coming. But in my professional music life, I bring them with me as well. Um, it could be playing for dances somewhere. Um, and as soon as I feel that, oh, they are disciplined enough, and uh, well, I don't even think about that. I think that will happen when they come with me. <laughs> and. Playing for dances, uh, playing for concerts, and that is where, of course, I push them a little because then they uh, need to have their own sort of space in it. But in the beginning, I just let them play along uh, with mostly anything. So that's how it happens <laughs> at my place. <laughs> um, Matti, is there anything special you want me to say about this? Or, uh, oh, I could say that um, uh, I had a little group, uh, a, a little small ones, who was here for the Nakvadet Folk Scandia, uh, but they left uh, Wednesday morning. So these are some of my old students that I left behind because uh, they have been with me uh, for, for the gigs I had and even played with Tallari uh, yesterday also. So it's a, also a nice opportunity for these guys. <laughs> Yeah, I think we were just going to play some music for you. <laughs> I think that would be nice, wouldn't it? Yes. Armchairs, it's no go in a music <laughs> institution. <laughs> Actually, one thing I find annoying being in the, uh, the what do you call it in the in the professional setting in the uh, official music school and the official school systems is that they have these uh, fancy chairs that can do anything, but you can't sit and play on any of them. <laughs> well, either they have five legs and you're just trying to organize. <laughs> Where can I put my feet and you can't play the fiddle and it's sort of, why can't you figure out that a chair needs four legs and, <laughs> and just that? <laughs> <laughs> So we will go, uh, what can we do? You can start on a D, so you say D, D, D.
what I would do if there was a new one, I would just say which open strings they could play. Of course, they, I would tell them that this is called G and D and A and E. And that's actually just where we start. When they start uh, playing uh, the tune, I would just put numbers on, like the numbers of my fingers. One, open, two, three, open. And uh, I usually just shout it while we play. Um, instead of uh, showing them, they will get sheet music to bring home, but most of the time they really just want uh, how many fingers on which string. And it might take them years before they can hear that, uh, oh, this finger needs to be further up the board or further down. Uh, but I don't use like uh, methods, uh, stickers or anything. And um, People say I'm very, I, I feel I'm very impatient uh, otherwise, but uh, with this, I'm, I don't hear, uh, I, I can hear that they don't play uh, uh, intonation wise good, but I know it'll come. Uh, it might take uh, years, but uh, at one point, they are so, so, suddenly, the, the, the mind grows and they, um, they grow up and the, the connection, oh, what I hear up here, I can actually change here. Uh, I don't want to enforce it very much. Uh, sometimes I just take, in, in the solo classes, we can try to do a little intonation or a little bit of, if you hold your hand a little different, that'll be easier. And um, Otherwise, I don't do much of that. Um, you were saying, um, Mauritius, you have uh, the drumming um, tradition, which yeah. is so cool. And I really would like to hear so much more about it. And um, but you know, also when you do a um, book on it, and other people are using your system, they will interpret it, uh, interpret yeah. it a different way. So what you might have intended might not. If, if for instance, if uh, that book would be used by a person somewhere else who never heard uh, your style but just saw it on sheet music paper, it would be like totally different. And you wouldn't recognize this. It, they could use it for something else. It would be a new thing. It wouldn't be what you had in your mind when you did it. So there's always going to be recreation. Recreation, yes. And uh, something will get lost and some new thing will uh, 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 be coming out of it. Uh, what I find, uh, especially with the uh, Sonoho music, compared to a lot of other places in Denmark, is that um, none of the people in Sonoho uh, learned to play an instrument. They just found an instrument. Or th that's how I think of it. Uh, maybe there was a fiddle lying around. Okay, we have this instrument. I'm going to do something on it. Because none none of the instruments are played like they are supposed to be played if you learned it uh, in a music school. Um, so a lot of uh, the stuff is opposite uh, what you would learn. The bowing, uh, how you hold the fiddle and you would be sliding and, and all that, it, which you wouldn't learn if you were classically trained. Uh, Mark was uh, playing the guitar, he invented his own way of playing because there was no uh, uh, traditional way of uh, playing the guitar for the family music. And uh, what everybody finds uh, and has been done, no matter what instrument they were playing, they played the tune, like the melody. If, if it's a, a chord instrument, he would still have the tune, the melody, in, in his head. He wouldn't make like a course uh, uh, schema, what's it called, a chord diagram for it, because there wouldn't be any chord diagram that would fit the style. It's always the tune that decides, uh, decides where to go with the chords. And you have to know the tunes. Um, and uh, that's why most people end up playing the fiddle anyway. <laughs> <laughs> he actually does that too. <laughs> Good, I think we are about to uh, have a coffee break. Uh
I think we may, might be a bit overdue, but you want one, one another tune? Yes. 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 But could we bring in the, are the Mauritian people here still? The Mauritian yes. Yeah. Mauritian could we get the uh, drummers up here? <laughs> That would be so nice. <laughs> and could you bring your uh, your uh, gas uh, yeah, petrol can? So we're going to play, um, uh, this is not uh, from Sonoma, but it's just traditional Danish. Maybe, because the tune also exists in Scotland, Ireland, and in the Celtic countries, and the rhythm, I find, would fit very good with the Mauritius uh, people's drumming. I don't know, I haven't tried it, I just felt like it. <laughs> Could you bring your drums? And maybe the triangle as, as well? Yeah, yeah. the rubber is not warm anymore, but yeah. we can try. Oh, never mind. Uh, it's just that the gas has gone. The gas oh. has gone already. Oh, you don't have your... Uh, yeah, it's not, it's not like it. Annoying when they take your instruments. <laughs> <laughs>
So now we go on with the program. We go. We have a small coffee break, and uh, there will there's a lot of kids in the lobby, so don't get uh, scared. You just try to to find your way to the counter, and then they will play, and then we can come back.
false pitting, but I will anyway go through my PowerPoint presentation as I had planned. And I will start by telling something about the causative dibling tradition. It's probably uh, well known for many of you, but a um, quick overview. Folk violin has been played here since the 1700s, and uh, the tradition has mostly been passed on within families. Uh, but also the weddings have played a central role. The weddings have been huge back in the old days. Until the 60s, we could have weddings that lasted up to three days and all, all the village people attended to the weddings and uh, there was traditional music played all the time. So this was the place where you could hear these traditional tunes and that's where you could adopt them also. Uh, we still, um, nowadays we have hundreds of amateur musicians, dancers and singers in all age groups here in Kaustinen and in the surrounding areas. Uh, and they, Kaustinen fiddle playing tradition was included on the UNESCO's list of intangible cultural heritage in December 2021. Uh, and the surrounding, by the surrounding areas, um, <coughs> I mean the Perho Valley district and some other communities that are close to the Kaustinen community. And nowadays the tradition is mostly passed on through formal and non-formal education. And the Napari method or the pedagog pedagogy is one of these ways that we pass on the tradition today here in Kaustinen. It was established in early 1980s in Kaustinen at the Perho River, River Valley Open College and it was established by my dad, Mauno. I don't know, he promised to come, but I don't see him here. He probably could, if, if you really paid attention, you probably could see him visiting the lab right? <laughs> during the last piece. <laughs> but but uh, we moved back to Kaustinen from Helsinki in the early 80s and, um, and uh, where he had a professional career as a classical musician playing in different orchestras. Uh, but since the Kaustinen tradition was very important to him, uh, he wanted to keep on the tradition, keep, keep the tradition going on by starting to teach kids here in the Kaustinen area. And at that time, the Finnish music education system was quite restrictive. It, it has been always well, no, well known for its effectivity, uh, but it was quite narrow and uh, restrictive, so not everyone could get into these music schools. And still there were lots of kids in the area who wanted to play. So he wanted to keep the tradition going on and started to create his own system on the side, uh, which was flexible. You could do the exams if you wanted to, but you did not have to. Uh, there were no entrance exams uh, because the thought was that you, we wanted to include as many as possible and give an opportunity to everyone who wants to play. Uh, and the emphasis was on folk music and local traditions. But since the coasting and tears are quite complicated, you couldn't really start learn, start playing the violin by learning the coasting and tunes, which is why uh, Napparic music came along. And that's what you actually heard in the lobby there just now. It's arranged folk music with various difficulty levels, as Tove also showed us. Where you can join in by playing the open strings. And you were shouting the strings, but we use bass expressions. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so little difference there. Uh, yeah, and it's based mostly on Finnish folk music, but we also do music from other other countries, especially Nordic countries. And as you all now heard, we also play one Norwegian too. And we also play both traditional and new music. Singing is also important because that way you can include more kids to the activities, <coughs> even if they don't really know how to play yet. So they can still sing. Lyrics are both traditional and new, and influences are from classical music, pop, other cultures, and history. Uh, the classical music actually has a long tradition here in Kaustinen, so it's very closely connected to the music that we play here, and the Kaustinen tradition in itself also has its roots uh, partly in classical music. Uh, 
which is why, why we also include that in our teaching. Uh, sheets are used as support, but the style is adapted by listening also, uh, like, like we heard earlier today. And the principle, there's five principles. We want to offer the opportunity to learn music to anyone who wants it. And one really important uh, point is that we want to make playing music a part of daily life so that it isn't something special. You go to, to go to your lesson and pick up your violin and then you learn your lessons and go back home and maybe practice or maybe not. But it should be like that you just grab your instrument and play. Yeah, <laughs> and that's also what we've heard today. <laughs> so, yeah, lots of similarities there. Um, and we want to create a good relationship to the music for the students. And by that we don't mean that it's necessarily like, it. well, when, when we talk, talk about the good relationship, it's usually that we want to um, educate new audiences for the professionals. Well, it could be also that, but we also want them to be able to play themselves and to have low barriers on just playing. And yes, uh, that is that happens by encouraging musicians of all ages and levels to play together, as you just saw now. And the one that we also want to keep the folk music tradition vibrant and incorporate in the curriculum. And in the beginning, mm -hmm. I told that the, that the um, tradition is passed on mostly through non-formal but also formal education, uh, and that is why. Uh, why I said this, said this is that the curriculum in Finland has actually changed a little bit during the recent years and it does include traditional music nowadays more than it did before. And yeah, all together we want to promote unrestricted timeless music education. Today, Napparet, we get together weekly as a group of 70 players in Kausen and that, that's the group you just saw there in the lobby. It's not all, all from Kaustin, but from the surrounding areas also. And uh, that was Napari music. The first tune was traditional Finnish, uh, Kaustin and Kaustin wedding music. Uh, but uh, we don't play the traditional Kaustin tunes that much with all the kids. But the bigger, older kids, uh, they get to learn the, the, learn the um, traditional tunes through Pizza Challenge which is that they get a set of uh, tunes that they need to learn and then when they're finished, when they're ready, they get to play them together with the local master fiddlers. So it's not an exam or anything, it's just an occasion where you gather together and play together. And when you've done that, they get pizza. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and then they get a new set of tunes. <laughs> Uh, yes, we do have some international cooperation with Nordic countries, mostly uh, so some other European countries. South Africa, we have quite a long tradition. We've actually built marimbas here. We have a large <laughs> uh, room full of marimbas here, just a bit that way, which we use also sometimes when we play with the kids. So that has been fun. Uh, and nowadays we also want to encourage other others in exploring their own traditions. Uh, we do have these NAPRE courses around the Finland and the target groups are mostly these classical uh, music scores. Uh, and uh, even if we use the NAPRE music uh, and the teachers in the schools use NAPRE music as a part of their teaching, uh, the main point is that, that it's should be just an inspiration or an example of how you can pass on the tradition, how, can you, how you can explore your own roots and your own traditions. So that's what we want to do by teaching around in Finland and in other countries too. Thank you. There's some more information for you if you want to. And uh, I guess it's time for the panel debate now. Thank you so much, uh, Nick. Uh, now we will have a panel discussion and also we will 
Uh, here's some ideas from the audience, so you can all join. So I ask all the presenters who have been to here to sit in a nice floor. Maybe we have to. Yeah. You know who you are, I think. Yeah. Here, the, uh, um. You can just uh, pick any place. So now we have heard uh, a lot of things, uh, we have uh, many ideas, I, I just actually want to give uh, the floor first to, to Birgit, you were the first one, some ideas of uh, uh, what you have heard now and uh, experienced, uh, what, what is on your mind, general question. Yeah, what I, uh, thank you very much, um, thank you very much for the, this uh, presentation of all of you. Um, what I have in mind is that luckily uh, here in Finland and in Denmark and as well in Mauritius uh, the families are together and so through the family tradition, uh, through the family learning and social life um, uh, music could be transferred uh, into the future. Um, many of those people I'm in contact with and collaborating, they are separate from their families. So they are, uh, we, we do not have several generations uh, anymore. We have very often only men, not women. Uh, and uh, so there is a part of the social experience loss because, um, yeah, only the half of the gender is there. Uh, very often there are no, f no children um, uh, along. Uh, and um, that we have to look uh, different on the world if uh, this basic experience you use to create your music education systems is not there anymore. How can we, how can we do it? So this was one of of uh, the points I, which came in my mind. Thank you. And then Vilma, just uh, free. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Absolutely wonderful uh, afternoon uh, and lots of thoughts. I, I really feel what Anne said uh, just now when you started your presentation that we're all speaking the same thing, actually. And this, uh, I mean, I'm a folk musician, I'm a folk music educator, I know something about the <laughs> thing, I've lived it for, uh, for many, many years, since my childhood. And, uh, but somehow, uh, here today, I felt really that like all the, like the research and the theoretical perspectives, that they even more came to life, like yes, this is exactly what, what, what is behind those uh, big words and the thinking. And I also, I was quite, um, it got me thinking a lot what you, how you explained about these challenges, like the academics, yeah. uh, like uh, not uh, uh, turning to the get, turning their gaze on these kind of practices and how hard it is to, Oh. <laughs> How hard it is to convince the politicians and the kind of that level of people when the links between the uh, academic uh, research, the practitioners and uh, kind of the knowledge that we have, they have in their practices, 
when those links are uh, not there and it's not coherently uh, there, then it's really hard to communicate, articulate. What are we actually doing? Why are we doing? And what's the uh, benefit? And I think we do need the like some kind of innovative uh, uh, projects where we try things and see what happens. Try out something, breaking the barriers, trying out something that has not been done and then uh, articulated in all levels, from all perspectives. So thank you for the inspiration. <coughs> And then, uh, Alan, some uh, ideas that uh, came from... Yeah, I'm, I'm really sensitive to the comments that have just been made. Um, we really face those types of challenges and we have to stand to those challenges. <clears throat> you know, um, the point about not being able to do that is that uh, there are big parts of society that can still continue to look down upon mm -hmm. the communities and their traditions. So that's really important because as society functions, the words of academics counts more than the words of the ordinary people. So we have to get sufficient energy support in order to stand by those communities and this is what we've been doing and UNESCO has been helping us a lot in terms of uh, have us accredited now as an NGO and we must say that since that accreditation people are more sensitive to what we say that's the good part of it uh, on another count, I would like to respond to uh, that idea of um, documenting or not documenting the work that is being done at the community. You know, uh, our experience and uh, the way things have been transmitted to us from past generation clearly shows that uh, we've lost so many things and the main reason for that is because we didn't we were not in a position to document that those communities they were oral communities they were things were transmitted orally so we lost enormous amounts of richness so this is why some 30 years back we started to document that instrument we went throughout the island, we met people, we observed how they played it and we had no choice than to document it because otherwise it's lost. So um, we, it has some inconvenience because once you put something in writing you lose maybe something out of it but then we have to look for the the least traumatic uh, solution and I still believe that we do have to document or else we lose it and uh, this is the work uh, we've been going on doing for uh, so much time now that's it thank you and then uh, Buber I don't know, a follow up on that, and today you have a lot of opportunities to bring sound and pictures in the documentation, so it won't be just the written words, uh, which would make more sense in the future, and it's really great that you can do that. So, I think that is good. Uh, I think, yeah, if somebody can document, uh, let us do the work, let us do the playing, and uh, uh, just focus on supporting it um, instead of having us do other kinds of work like uh, uh, trying to get money for a project and trying to this and that and why can't we just play here? Why can't we just uh, uh, do what we're supposed to do? 
uh, as we said, the academics, and uh, it, it's so easy for them to say that, oh, this is not important because uh, they want something that is success, that is measurable. If we can't see on a measure that this is a good thing, then we won't support it. You know what I mean? It's, uh, yes, it's we, we, we are so, us on the floor, we, you, you can just walk all over us because you can't uh, measure yeah. the work we do uh, and the joy it brings to kids and grown-ups also and how important it is for what you do with your uh, kids the, with the music bringing actually big subjects uh, work around that and if you have a group of uh, Napari kids there will always be some of the kids would have some issues and you can help them by being around music and there are so many things that they <coughs> but they can't measure it so they don't want to support it it's because they I mean, this don't want we have to do it ourselves but we have to do everything you have ourselves good it feels like that you, you, you <laughs> have good of people that have been in unfortunately we don't have them in Russia I mean, they may exist in other countries and they we can provide them with examples that are working out well in other countries. I mean, uh, the important thing about academics is that they are non-practitioners. Exactly. Many of them are non-practitioners. And they have a personal assistance that, to do their emailing and to uh, yeah, do all that. <laughs> 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 yeah. And it's, it's true because every time we need to do something on a computer or doing a presentation or whatever, it takes time yeah. off the music with the kids or in the society. Yeah. Get into competition with. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You have to do both then. <laughs> <coughs> Very good. Anne. Thanks. Yeah, yes. I'm not an academic, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was just trying to figure out how to answer this. <laughs> on these things here. Uh, yeah, I do feel the same about the, this problem that you told you were talking about. But we actually do. We did, did have this big program, research program, Arts Equal mm -hmm. in Finland, mm -hmm. that gave us a lot of results which we can refer to when we do our PowerPoints. <laughs> <laughs> so, and uh, so there has been some efforts, but obviously there's always a need for more. And that's why I'm really glad that, for, for example, you are working with these issues on that, from that point of view. Yeah. I can just add something which is uh, of interest in this debate. You know, the first time the merchant state attempted to get the Segati Peak inscribed, they failed. And you know why? No relation with, uh, with the communities. That's it. And it was prepared solely by academics. Mm -hmm. So then they came to us for the comments of the UNESCO mm -hmm. and we helped prepare the document which was approved. Mm -hmm. So that's it. But I, I would like to, uh, uh, let's say, take a word for the academics. Myself, I'm not academic, but uh, I, I think um, uh, that in fact it's not a problem with academics. It's a, uh, because um, if you take the academic series, and uh, Vilma is one of the very, very best examples you have here in, in Finland, uh, the academic work uh, is exactly uh, looking for what is needed as change in, 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 in that field of research. And so th this is the basic uh, uh, information you need uh, to have a, a look from outside and on what you are doing. But the, the, the problem is that the decision makers on certain um, budgets, education institutions or whatever, they are politicians. And the politicians are not trained ne neither as uh, artists nor as academic. And so there is a lack of, of communication between the three 
columns of of the academics, of the, the practitioners and the politicians. And this lack of communication uh, uh, creates the most of the problems because if those three elements would talk to each other, um, then the results would be better for the entire society. And I think that that's where we need the kind of these perspectives. But then again, I, I really feel also what you like i think this is very much correct i mean you this is the ma most important thing for you to keep on playing the music and uh, live your life to do the work and lovely examples of the <laughs> young generation we see that uh, so it's not i think one of the challenges is that uh, and it becomes a challenge if everyone tries to do everything mm -hmm. because then it's a it's another business yeah. But then, on the other hand, I, I do feel that uh, it's quite quite important to somehow, and this challenge of like uh, someone doing outside something without even realizing what they are see looking at or what is the uh, what is the actual soul and no, heart no. in the in the activities and why why it, why it's no important. Connection. Yes, so. And I think uh, research has suffered quite long uh, uh, when, when it comes to matters of this, uh, this area, uh, of this kind of, I mean, it's coming back to the problem of colonial, colonialization, colonization mm -hmm. uh, uh, kind of not being able to recognize the various types of knowledges and knowledge systems and the also something that well, some, some something came from what you said somehow excluding the emotional side yeah. of the activities <coughs> but kind of looking at things through this kind of technical mm -hmm. lenses but yeah it was you who said uh, quite accurately about the uh, it's not measurable yeah so what can you make out yeah. of it yeah. Yeah. so kind of finding methodologies or uh, like okay, I, I believe that these things are measurable, yeah. but not in terms of like numbers. Yeah. Or yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. They go by that. And mm -hmm. this is one of the challenges um, doing research in this area is that you cannot exclude the emotion no. and the holistic being a human and kind of the humanity. So that has to be kind of somehow also embedded in the. Mm -hmm. If we want to understand yeah. what why is this important, but I mean we know all that our societies currently place little uh, value yeah. in those kind of things, yeah. but yeah. I think that that's the revolution that needs. To we need we need a revolution yeah. because <laughs> we yes revolution <laughs> now <laughs> <laughs> really really I think that we must come to terms with the basic idea that society is constructed with the power relations. Yeah. Anyway, it is like that, and really you need a revolution to change that. But in the meantime, we <laughs> have to stand <laughs> on our own. Yes. Um, which means that there are those two areas of knowledge, the popular the community knowledge and the organization's knowledge. The, I was talking about an alliance that we should strengthen and then go to the other powers and show them, impress them, look for creative means of getting them to us. I think that could be a sort of solution. <laughs> so we started it with, uh, with the politicians. Okay. Then uh, Annika... I had a comment on this, what you're talking about, because last year I was in, uh, on the board of Finnish Music Council, and then uh, we, we got to meet all the different parties, the people in power, um, several, several meetings, and I realized there that we need need a layer of people who are, understand or are musicians and understand that to a police, politician you have to you have to show the research why this would be very good to fund this or that. Here's the research because that's that's how what they reacted to the research when we were able to mention this research shows this. That's why we have to fund this for the children or for the community. And then that's, that's the language they understand. So we need to, you're right about that, we need to on our own figure out what is it that make, makes that group tick and then do that. Yeah. That was the thing.
Pardon me. Yeah, well, uh, I think that to get the message true, uh, through to the people who decide, it's really about, as everything today is <laughs> about repeating and about who shouts the most, <laughs> who shouts the loudest. <laughs> and I think we need to unite in that way because we all think alike and if we go and send the same message from all from the different directions, I think that might also help. Mm. Yeah. yeah, but this is uh, this is one of the most difficult things uh, to uh, to to unite. This means to to create uh, a kind of uh, we say in, in 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 practical terms to create a kind of federation uh, to 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 have a common world. Uh, but in fact, is creating a new community on a uh, on a different level, on a larger level. The, 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 it's a community with common sense. We need today, even if we come from different parts, uh, to have an amplified voice. Mm -hmm. And if we and now we get into the reality, if we look, I'm I'm, I'm now in the field of of uh, world music as activists since about 40 years and we still not have on the European level one federation speaking, amplifying our words to the decision makers in the European Commission. And the European Commission is defining a lot of uh, those background power systems uh, which are interfering at the end the last uh, school in the village. So uh, this is one of the major problems of the, of the let's say, um, uh, folk and world music scene in Europe that there is not a, a common um, federation or whatever uh, form. Yeah, I'm trying to uh, how to f say it. I don't really know. Uh, one thing, though, I find we might be a little um, cautious about is trying to make the folk music like a thing that needs something to stay alive. Because I think it'll be like that with everything. Some things die out and some things uh, remain. And we can say that we will we have lost a lot of treasures in sort of, yeah, any country, any society. And we have documentation for something, and we are doing something now, and it changes, and uh, I, f I feel that we need to be sure that the people on the floor are with us, uh, are buying music, uh, wanting music, uh, playing music, and all that, and uh, on top of that, it's good if there is. A, it was wrong of me to say the academics are, are doing it wrong because it is the decision makers, it's the politicians. Mm -hmm. It's it's right that you can you can measure something, and there is somebody who should do that work. But it's I find that in my line of work where I I talk to decision makers sometimes, but I mostly talk to people who just want music for a birthday. <laughs> <laughs> they don't think of it as like, it's woe, it's, uh, it's a gold treasure tradition. They really want music just to be played for uh, seven, eight hours and maybe a bit more if uh, people are in a good mood. <laughs> they don't think of it uh, like from from that perspective, like it's it's uh, treasurable, uh, like we know it is. Uh, I I wish we could just play it and know it is treasurable and keep that going, but without feeling that you sometimes need a lot of uh, financial support. It's it sort of it gets like uh, an, an unemployment office. Uh, uh, oh, I'm a folk musician. Oh, then you should apply for this. Mm. It's, it's, oh, it's degrading in a bit. I think sometimes uh, things also need to survive by hard, by hard work and uh, fitting into the... We, we, we can't change, we need the revolution, but we can't do that. So in the meantime, we have to do what we can. Does it make any sense? <laughs> <laughs>
Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I remember when you told about the, the kids in, in Pena that they, when they travel away from the island and they can come back and they realize that it's actually very valuable what they have. Uh, we all have the same problem here in Copenhagen. We grow up in a bubble. Yeah. And, and when we move away, I've done that myself. That's, that's when you start to realize, okay, this is what we have. And what also happens that uh, when you realize, when you can look, it from, from a dis look at it from a distance, uh, you can also start to compare your own culture with the other cultures, and that's the key, for me at least, it's to be the key to understand the other cultures as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, I think, is, as you said, people don't need to think about that, but the people who realize these aspects, uh, they need to get this message out to the people who, de who decide, and this is a general message. I don't mean I don't know if this even is a federation <laughs> because this is nothing nothing to be argued argued about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, I mean, maybe I was that 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 was what I was meaning when I was talking about the getting the message out, the general uh, values of the traditions on a very general level. Yeah. Yeah. To add up on that, it's a, uh, it's. It's a fact, however, that in this time where we live now, uh, I mean, the traditions have always been evolving, changing, mm -hmm. adapting. I mean, that's the nature of tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, in these times where uh, it's kind of like everything is behind the one click on the yeah. phone or yeah. the computer, so kind of this is where, where it really becomes, as, as educators, and I think it's quite important that we, we reflect back what is actually the role of tradition. Why do we need to connect with something uh, in the past or in the existing? What is our community? And this becomes quite a crucial question for the mm -hmm. musicians that Birgit was uh, talking about. because. I mean, that's part of the humanity very strongly as well. If you don't know your roots, if you, if you don't yeah. have, how, how you said it, if you, like, if you have the home, you have to have the home somewhere. Yeah. If you don't know what that is or don't recognize any cultural expressions that you come from, it's, it becomes really hard to understand anyone else yeah. as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. And this is where the hegemonies, in a way, come, in, uh, come into the picture because yeah all we hear from the television and radio and what attracts the young people inevitably because it's everywhere is the popular music western popular music and all those <coughs> structures and hegemonies. Uh, hegemonies so kind of we are this is quite existential question for us is is there value or can we just say that like okay kids do what you want and uh, we know then what then they want because if they they are not exposed, we are not taking care of yeah, it's the abilities of to connect. Then yeah. the connection is not so there. So there are various forms of transmission. You can transmit good things, as you can transmit things that would kill <coughs> other things. So somehow, I think that we really need to be somehow scared about. We are scared in Mauritius because for years. That instrument, that hand drum, had nearly disappeared in the 40s up to the 60s, 70s. We barely saw people uh, playing the rabans, and in Mauritius we can count on the hands of one, on the fingers of one hand, only, the number of people that are still manufacturing this instrument. So we are really scared if there's nothing done to uh, preserve this tradition. So somehow all those emotions that we have been able to share with you, even though you are not from our country with that instrument, will lose, lose it. So that would be a real pity if we can't do something to preserve that tradition. But yeah. I, I, I would even put something on top. If you look to Afghanistan, uh, not only the music is banned and the musicians are banned, uh, the instruments are distorted mm -hmm. and uh, so 
the instrument makers are killed, the instruments are destroyed, uh, the musicians are uh, in hidden houses or uh, dis uh, uh, displaced all around the world. And how, how could you, uh, and there is a very pure documentation uh, about how to make and how to um, construct, uh, build an instrument. And those musicians who are uh, uh, displaced abroad, they were not able to bring the instrument along. So there is a lack of instruments and, uh, and a lack of knowledge. So anyways, this is a lost, uh, a lost world. But what comes after this lost world? Do we give up those people? Or in what kind of way is it possible to uh, to, to, to share our values of common life and, and all the good things of music um, uh, to create new perspectives of, of a kind of super diversity. This mm. is, I think, mm. the, the first one. Mm. Yeah, very short. Uh, in my group, uh, who went home on Wednesday, we have a girl from Syria uh, who's a refugee from Syria and uh, actually they don't. Uh, they are told that they are going back to Syria at some point. <coughs> but she is the only one of her uh, sisters uh, that were uh, not born in Denmark. The rest is born in Denmark. But Shanghai, she plays the fiddle. She's doing the dancing. She's now was here, uh, experiencing the Finnish uh, tradition. At home, she plays the um, sass, and uh, she is keeping on to her own tradition with the group of Syrians who are in Denmark. Um, they don't get to meet often and they don't get to meet everybody, but she is also being part of the Danish culture now, and especially the family culture, and her little sisters as well. They're all picking up instruments and playing the, uh, the music on, on family now, and is involved in the local society very much. And it, it doesn't work that way always, I know. I wish it could be, but I, I find that uh, it's very important that we don't say to people, you don't have any culture anymore. Um, their own culture, what they, they come from, is very important. But as somebody said, is what comes after? Because if there's nothing to go back to. Yeah, that's part of the solution. Mm -hmm. That's part of the solution. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I promised uh, that uh, we will stop sharp uh, at 3 o'clock. So uh, we will give uh, applause to everybody. Thank you very much, our presenters and uh, our speakers and our music makers and, uh, and uh, the coffee makers. Coffee makers. <laughs> and, uh, yes. And uh, just a few words in the end. I think uh, the I personally always like the revolutionary uh, talk. <laughs> and I was very happy to hear hear it here. And uh, just maybe one reminder about when we talk about the community or the that we need this uh, awakening in a way, so that the world sees these kind of ways of, of teaching community music or, or passing on our uh, heritage. Then also we have to rem uh, remember that we already have something. We have the UNESCO Convention. Mm -hmm. We have, and you have a very good uh, experience that we, we can use this convention to say for the safeguarding of the intangible cultural heritage, that we can use it so that these things get recognized yeah. with the politicians, with the researchers, and then actually with the practitioners also. also. So there are, it's not ready and it's not perfect, it never is, uh, but there are some tools already there and then we just have to combine them and then uh, share them with each other and then, then we, we can go on. But now we go to the real life, to the festival, to, <laughs> to dance and, and play and, and listen. So thank you very much. Thank you.